everybody for tuning in and we want to also uh, uh, ask everybody to uh, get ready for a brand new start. We, we're, uh, this ministry that we have, we're getting back to focus more so on what we were called to do and that is discipleship. Amen. And so um, this, uh, our ministry that the Lord has given us is to make disciples and we have been doing many things at the same time as not that we're buried off, but we do need to focus more on. And as we begin to focus more on, we're going to actually launch, uh, how do you pronounce it again, blog? Blog Talk Radio Broadcast for Charlotte Christian Fellowship. Now, we're already doing it in the sense that my wife is, uh, with her uh, book that she written, A Life's Uncertain Journey, we've already uh, began doing that. And the subject matter that she's uh, related to, I think the first one was the first We're one. talking about discerning the voice of God right now. We uh, broadcast every Tuesday evening at seven o'clock for one hour. Okay. And so what that does also identify, uh, you know, and for the individuals who are listening, you know, who's talking to you. And that's the whole thing about discipleship because we hear voices, we hear ourselves, talking to ourselves. We, we hear the, uh, those who are walking, trying to uh, get to know Christ. We hear the word of uh, God, the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And also we hear the, the enemy, which is the devil speaking to us. So now when uh, those are three different voices, but remember the flesh wars against the spirit yes. all, the time. all the time. So uh, when, when I say that there's three different voices, we have free will. See that free will can be listen to the voice of the enemy or listen to the voice of the Lord. So, but what we're going to do is get more into um, uh, discipleship and, uh, and uh, uh, participation more, okay? So we'll be launching. What we have stopped doing really also is sending out the link to how you can uh, tune in to this morning service. And we're going to start doing that again, but the link is going to be different. It's going to be with the blog radio, okay? So you can actually call in, participate, and view at the same time. You can always go to our website at Charlotte Christian Fellowship where you'll find a link to this broadcast as I mean as well as the blog talk radio broadcast that we're going to add. Amen. Amen. And uh, what we want to do also at this time is to uh, let everybody know what's been going on. Um, uh, we did mention a little bit about uh, my wife's um, uh, you know the, the, the women's was well, not just women by the way we stop saying that too. It's, it's, it's for everybody who likes to tune in because it uh, doesn't make a difference whether you're a woman or a man, young or old, you still have those three uh, uh, specific things, the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Because God calls out to you, you know, he, he know, while we're still in our sins. So uh, we still hear him as, a, as an infant or as a young adults or as a full adults. We still either hear him from the Holy Spirit, ourselves, or the enemy. One of, the, one of those three is going to study be talking to us. And so... What we want to do is to uh, begin to not only uh, identify, but also once you do know, what do you do with that information? Okay, uh, mm -hmm. that's what we, the, the step that we're going to be doing inside of our blog, that's what like we do on our, our Sunday morning. What do you do with the information once you get it? That's right. Uh, it, the, the Lord in his word says, we don't throw uh, pearls at swine. 
So you're not swine. We're not swine. So therefore, when he shares the word with us, we're supposed to act on him. We're not supposed to remain babes in Christ, study drinking milk. Once you confess that the Lord's Savior is our, is our Savior, uh, that's just initial, initial. Okay, that's the very, very, that's infant stuff. Then we got to do the work. We got to let the Holy Spirit work through us. Okay, so in order to do that work, you got to know who's talking to you. Indeed. Okay. And you know, James tells us in the book, uh, I think in chapter four, um, that he talks about faith without works. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not so much that our faith is predicated by our works, but the other word or way around. The things we do are predicated by our faith. In other words, faith is acting upon what you believe in God's word. Mm -hmm. So you just don't read it and say, oh, mm -hmm. oh yeah, that's good stuff. That's mm -hmm. good stuff. That's deep. You know, and some people leave it at that, that realm. But God didn't leave us his word for that purpose. That's We're supposed right. to be not only hearers of the word, but doers mm -hmm. of his word. Yes. That's where the working comes in. Yes. So we get to work out god's word in our lives and so uh as a part of what god has called us to do in Amen. discipleship mm -hmm. is to help teach you that mm -hmm. if you don't just leave it at the information let's move beyond that where we see some actual life transformation taking place and we see the kingdom of god being advanced by us exercising our faith in god's word uh i don't know where it's written that but, uh working out your salvation our salvation is a, a gift from god Okay, so uh, the work we do is not to work out our salvation. It's to do the will of the Lord. Not our will be done, but his will be done. And as we're doing that, we're being obedient to his word. And uh, our salvation is a gift that he's given us. But we have to, uh, as we're here, we're to do the work of God, to do his will. That's our job. We have a, a description as his disciples, a job description. His, his, our job description is one thing, to make disciples to make disciples. And you have to be trained first. You have to get into the word first. You have to know who you are first in Christ Jesus before you go out and do something. You don't just tell somebody to do it because you read a book. You first be partaker. You can read the Bible 24 seven. Okay, know all the information. But if you look what God says, he wrote it for the foolish. Okay, so those wise people came and get it. So therefore, like, if you wanna you know, do the Lord's work, you have to humble yourself, you have to uh, uh, listen to the Holy Spirit because anything you do in uh, work and labor yourself, you'll get tired or you're doing it in, in your own strength and that's not from God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Father God, we thank you for this beautiful day that thou hast made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. We're grateful, Father God, for every opportunity you give us to bring glory to your name. Yes, Lord. Because that is your goal and purpose for creating us in the first place. That we would show forth the glory of him who brought us out of darkness into the marvelous light. And that, Lord God, is what we desire to do. And we know that our Savior left us a mandate, that we would reproduce mm -hmm. and multiply. Even as you said in the beginning, you said, be fruitful and multiply. You're telling your disciples, do the same thing. Make Amen. more disciples, Amen. you know, so that his kingdom can be advanced. So, Father, use us for that purpose. We ask, Lord God, that your word become a mirror for us yes. that father god we're not preaching to folks and not preaching to ourselves mm -hmm. but the same word that you give us Lord god we know belongs to us and it is for us so we thank you for this time we ask for you to open the eyes of those who may be blind unstop the ears of those who cannot hear so that they can have the illumination of your word to come alive in them that they could walk it out in everyday life in jesus name we pray amen. in jesus name amen amen um uh, again, we want to bring up some things. Next week, uh, we will we'll be gone. Ne was it next week, the week mm -hmm. after that. It's uh, next week. Next week. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll be um, on travel. On travel, but that's Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I think, right? This weekend, this week coming up. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we're going up to uh, visit uh, my my uh, daughter. I don't like call in laws. My, my son's wife, and she's uh, uh, having an event in Greensboro, I think it is. Her church actually uh, is a part of a larger event that is sponsored by the uh, Global um, global Ministries. And, and so 
Bishop Ellis, I think is the overseer. But anyway, they're having a, uh, their annual gathering here in uh, Greensboro, mm -hmm. uh, North Carolina, and we're going to um, go and fellowship with them for a couple of days. Okay. And then the following... The following week is our travel. Travel. And we'll be up in D.C. area. Yes. Okay. D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. Uh, we, um, if we're not uh, broadcasting... Uh, uh, Which we hope we will be. We hope we will be. But if we're not, uh, we'll do a recording. With, you can always go on our website, the wife we just mentioned, and then review some, something that we've done in the past. But remember something. Uh, the relation, what we're building is disciples. Your discipleship is also being in praying. So uh, when we're not on the air or, or we're not talking with you, right at what time it is, you're supposed to have communication with the Lord. We're to lead you to him. We're not to be your uh, uh, people. You, you look up to us. We want you to look to him. We're to point you to him. And if mm -hmm. you're looking at us as to be ones who can save you, please, uh, please do not do that. Uh, God says he's a jealous God. So our job is to lead you to him. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah, and we're no different from you. That's right. We are, we are the church. You're the church. We're the church. Yes. And we are the body of Christ. And God moves in different ways uh, how he desires to use us. Mm -hmm. But he said that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together with Amen. one another. So find, you know, you can find a fellowship to go and sit and hear the word of God. Yes. You know, uh, but, but uh, what, what the fellowshipping part is different from what he's called us to do and purposed us to do. Your ministry is, your, is the ministry God gave you, your assignment, whatever it is, whether it's going to pray with the sick, whether it's, you know, dealing with the youth or whatever it is, that is your assignment and you are to fulfill that assignment. However, God says, I still want you to know that as you see the end approaching, you still have to fellowship with one another. So mm -hmm. fellowship somewhere Amen. with a, a house of God. If you haven't found a, a church a family where you, where you could uh, abide, and you're still searching, that's okay. If it's the house of God, it's the house of God. And you can go in and fellowship. You know, but if it is not the house of God, I would not suggest that you stay there. But um, because there's so many false religions that are going on out right now, but the Holy Spirit will guide you. Amen. And remember also, uh, as the pastor is speaking, you have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, your phone, just download the app. You can follow along with them when he's, uh, what he's teaching. And I'll write, take a note, then go home then and study for yourself. Because just hearing the word and not being doing the word is, you know, it's, it's not of God. You know, the enemy knows the word of God. you said you're deceiving yourself. That's what the scriptures say. Amen. And, and the enemy knows the word of God, mm -hmm. but he don't do now, not one piece of it. So you don't want to be like that. You want to grow in the wisdom and the knowledge of God. So when the time comes to be used, he can use us because Amen. he can say once you've gone through, because we're all going through something one way or another. That's right. We weren't then by Jesus when he told Peter. But once you have been set to what you have gone through, don't forget. You know, go back and get your brother. Mm -hmm. So that's what we want to do. We want to raise you up, strengthen you in the word of Christ. Where you can uh, have your resources there. You can actually pray with him. He's your father. That's who our father is. He's, mm -hmm. uh, he actually tells you to call him father. Okay. And we kind of talk about that and the, the, the relationship is, between you and the Father, we we'll talk about the uh, relationship between you and your Holy, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about the relationship to you and Jesus Christ. Okay, we'll talk about the relationship with you and your, your wife, the, you and the people. We'll talk about the order in which uh, uh, we're supposed to God first, then the family, mm -hmm. then the church, then the world. We'll talk about those relationships. All of these things must be discussed, got to be discussed, and and and. In a, in a way that you can understand it, because these situations will come up through sometimes. The enemy is the ark of confusion, okay? And our job is to lead you to the word of God. Well, we're going to all fall short. None of us going to be perfect. None of us. Don't worry about that. But the thing is, though, we, we know Christ as a forgiver, because he, he forgives our sins when we can all continue to act. But we need to learn to know him as our Savior. God sent Christ to save us. We got to learn to know he's a savior, but we won't have to continue to sin. See, and those sinful things, it hurts our father, see, and so we can grieve the Holy Spirit without knowing it. 
And our job is for us not to do it. We got to begin to stop sinning, not only in the outward, but inward, in our hearts and our minds and, and our thought patterns. So uh, discipleship is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be having an opportunity to speak and ask questions and, and those type of things. And my wife just saying also, uh, uh, sometime my wife will be uh, uh, at another ministry helping to uh, 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 support uh, the ministry. Yeah, and I think we mentioned that to you all um, last week that, you know, we uh, had been uh, approached by uh, Pastor Kelvin Smith at mm -hmm. Still Creek Church of Charlie, which is uh, a, a former place of fellowship. Mm -hmm. And so, um, beautiful God place of has, fellowship, by the way. If you yes, it is. It is just a piece of heaven, if you, if you ask me. But um, anyway, uh, they are planting uh, a church in our community. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that my husband said the Lord told him is that we he wanted him to reach out to our community. Well, guess what? It's like God sent us help, you know? So we've got uh, a plant, church plant, uh, Still Creek Church of Charlotte, and uh, we had committed to, to join them in their plant and help them uh, to do this, which means establishing a lot of things. And so- um, Altering our schedule. Yeah, altering our schedules. Uh, but we're all the body of Christ. It's not like I'm gonna serve another ministry. It's all God's ministry. And God would have us to multiply his kingdom. And this is one way to multiply his kingdom by ensuring that the gifts God deposited us are available to the body. Amen. You see, that's, that's another thing people are selfish about. You know, they think it's all for them. You can't tell God what to do with the gift he gave you. Okay, he's the one that calls the shots. And so the gift that he gives us is for the body of Christ. Amen. And so we're going to uh, extend the gifts that God has given us to see how we can uh, be uh, help uh, Pastor Kelvin establish his fellowship. Amen. And so we might be in two places at once. She might be in one place, I'd be in another place. Mm -hmm. But again, my wife is just saying it's a, it's a uh, events in God's kingdom. Yes. What we're doing. Yes. Okay. So. Uh, and it's mm -hmm. wonderful. God is, he's amazing. And so a lot of uh, people say the vision is multiplication. It is. God multiplies, he That's doesn't right. divide. So uh, don't don't let those things confuse us. Another trick of the enemy. Yeah, that's okay. right. So, but uh, again, we want y'all to know that uh, uh, this is just July, and by the end of July, this is start September, which my wife had forgotten about. There's an event coming up in September. <laughs> <laughs> Go, you know that uh, uh, this Look, going I'm on. I'm 68. I'm allowed. So okay, get yes, you to get some I'm stuff. Okay. Laughing, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but the thing is, you you also have an opportunity to participate. Okay. Yes. This is another thing. God is, he, he, he loves us to work together to, because uh, we one body. That's right. Okay. So when you see a person, you say, well, I don't like the person because they look the shape or something like that, the color. That's not God. That's not God. The Bible actually says you don't, you don't tell the arm that you don't need the leg. Yeah, that's the right. Leg. So that's you don't right. know what that person is. But see, the thing is, because you have your prejudices that we grew up with, you'll mm -hmm. never know. So therefore, you actually, might be uh, offended and angry. Lord, the Bible yes. says, be careful who you uh, entertain. It could be an angel. So we just want you to know that uh, this event coming up in September, you can tell us more about it. Yes, and it's called, <laughs> uh, it's the Deborah's Voice Rally. What it is about, and it's very, uh, it's a blessing to me primarily, because in 2014, God gave, uh, deposited a vision in me, and I saw in this vision, all these women uh, in Washington, D.C., you know, lifting up their hands in worship and praise unto God. And um, so as a result of what I was, was seeing um, as in consulting with my pastor and all, it was an assignment that God was given to me. And so uh, I asked God for 300 women to go to Washington, D.C. to, number one, deliver the Mothers and Daughters of Faith Manifesto, which proclaimed to the federal government that we were not going to defy God in order to obey man. And so we delivered that, as a matter of fact, to the White House, to the Supreme Court, and also to Cap to the Capitol. And so, and, but instead of giving me 300 people to go, God gave me three. <laughs> and so I kind of felt like Gideon, you know. He said, you don't need all that, <laughs> you know, not for what I'm sending you to do. 
And so uh, we did have a chance to go. We prayed at the White House, at the Capitol, at the Supreme Court, just as God had ordered us to do. And so uh, we were obedient to that vision. And then here it is now, Deborah's voice is doing a, a greater manifestation, which I think is the vision that I saw. And they've got over 200,000 women that are going to be united in prayer and faith on the capital of Washington, D.C. on September 26, 2018. And if you want any more information about the event, uh, by all means, you can reach out to me at Nadine at Life's Uncertain Journey, and I can uh, give you some more information right now. We're in the planning stages of getting a, bu a bus to leave from Charlotte, North Carolina, of all the women representing Charlotte who are going to unite in this, in this wonderful uh, rally that's coming about. So I'm looking forward to it. Amen. And when you, when you get a chance to look uh, uh, in the Bible, look up Deborah. Oh yeah. Okay. Look up. Look up. Well, just saying uh, who Deborah is, and you'll be blessed by it. So don't think for one second that God don't use women. Remember, Christ mm. came through this world through a woman. First mm. person to see him when he rose was a woman. Okay. The one who he told to go and tell Peter and the disciples was a woman. Okay. So don't think for one second he doesn't use women. The woman who taught disciples. Uh, I forget the name of the brother who was before around Paul's time, but uh, 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 Priscilla and uh, what's Priscilla it? and Aquila. Yes, that, mm -hmm. that was helping the wife team. Yes. Like us. You see, doing the will of God. So God uses women as much as he uses men. So don't let the men thing say to you, well, this is a man. No, no, no. Yes. That's another trick of the enemy. That's another trick of the enemy. It is. Uh, uh, and Deborah is a, a perfect example. Perfect. The man wouldn't stand up, he wouldn't throw the woman. And what did she do? A powerful woman of God. So therefore, don't don't be don't don't get to stereotype and read to work for yourself. You might have a daughter who is a devil. You don't know. She might be a Mary. She don't know who she or, is. Or a JL. Okay, you don't you know, know who she is. That's right. You know, that's, so, right. that's right. You know, you don't know who she is. I mean last week, uh two weeks ago, I went to a women's conference called Warrior Queen Conference. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, the revelation God gave me in understanding that he intended that we be warrior queens. And I, I and right there in the middle of, of the beginning of God's creating the heavens and the earth, he declared war. But guess who he declared war between? Between the woman and Satan. Mm -hmm. We were ordained warrior queens from the get-go. However, you know, we, we just don't seem to get it, but I pray God reveals to us the purpose he's deposited in us as women. We influence men to do anything. What did Eve do? She influenced him. Her, she influenced the man of God to defy God. What kind of influence is that? Now, I wonder if that same influence was used to, to influence him to live for God. That's right. You see, that's what God intended. The, the influential power that we have as women is to encourage men towards righteousness, mm -hmm. not to love, not to serve our bodies and serve us and, and what they're going to do for us. No, he said man needed help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he created us to do it. Amen. But then we, we, we just get... Let the flesh get in the way. Yeah. So yeah. We've been doing that ever since. Yeah. But the Riley call is now. She's in the last phase, and that's why... It's been, uh, the world's been shaken up and uh, yeah. since men won't stand up. That's why you hear women, the cry of women, the Deborah cries coming. So uh, men refuse to stand for the Lord. So they got this pride thing going on. And um, with our job is to pray for those in leadership. Mm -hmm. I don't care whether you're a teacher, a uh, father, mother, uh, president of the United States, kings all over the world. Our job is to pray for those in leadership. But remember this, everybody. Many are called the fruit of the enemy. And we got to be ready. You see, we walk by Amen. faith and not by sight. Things of this world are going to disappear. Read your word. All that's going to disappear. But the thing is, those who trust in the Lord. So you got to walk by faith. Yes. These things going to happen. Everything that's happening, read, read the book of Daniel, Ezekiel. I mean, uh, what's the name? Uh, 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 all the, the, what's it called? Daniel, uh, uh, what's it called? Isaiah. Uh, those Ezekiel, Jeremiah, all the things, Revelation, they have a lot of things already, and they're in the mix of going Matthews. on. Matthew, yes, they're in the midst of they're, going on right now. 
But the thing is, if you don't read the word, you can say, oh, oh, like the men deceived by this world. There's nothing new down here, nothing. So our job as, uh, as God's living disciples uh, is to uh, point you to him so you won't be surprised that you'll be like the-, the Prepared. The, the, you'll be prepared just like the oil, the ladies with the oil lamp, five words and five, five words. Five versions and the five foolish versions. That's right. So we, we have to be real. Don't be deceived. What God says, he said, that all his words will come true. Not one word will disappear. Not one word. So if he said this word going to pass away, it's, it's going to pass. pass away. So uh, your name is written in the book, but he can't, you can't get blotted out. Okay? So my job as a Christ as a disciple is to point you to him, to encourage you, to uh, uh, this ministry is meant to make disciples. And uh, as we um, uh, making disciples, we're being disciples. And that's one of the things we have our brother Zach was helping mm -hmm. us out with. And uh, our brother Zach Putin is a, uh, he's his spiritual gift of teaching. I don't think more so preaching, but teaching the word of God as teaching discipleship, you know, breaking down the word for it's easy to understand, easy to chew and easy to use, easy to explain, easy to share. It's not still in his uh, information, but God has put it for that. Like, each one teach one. That's in the book of uh, Titus, okay? Yeah. And so as we began to... Uh, and we have his permission to share. Most definitely. We actually mm -hmm. went to visit him last year. And going to visit him again. He's going to be here when is it? Um, uh, in August. Yeah. August, I think it's August 7th and 8th. Uh, he's going to be in Atlanta. And uh, God willing, we are going to be right there. So when we come back from... Uh, DC mm -hmm. will be here for a second and mm -hmm. <laughs> go, go to Atlanta. Okay. So this is the traveling season. Uh, we get fed just like everybody else gets fed. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll be able to share again and uh go willing like uh walk with there. Maybe Zach allow us to uh, uh, do some live uh, uh broadcasting live then too. We don't know, but we'll ask him. But it depends on him if he says no, then we'll go ahead and mm -hmm. you know put it on there after the fact. But if he says yes, and then you got questions and stuff, hey, he might answer questions live for you. You know, so we don't know, but the thing is that like, uh, our job is, like I say, to make disciples. Uh, we don't want to be prideful, but we do want to, uh, you know, be obedient. Amen. So, and I wanted to, if you don't mind, I wanted to also share with those, the listeners who are on, and if you're living anywhere uh, in North Carolina, um, and you are looking for a place to fellowship, there's two we highly recommend. Yes. One of them is, uh, like we said, uh, Still Creek Church of Charlotte. On the south side, it's on Arrowwood Road. Yes. And also, you'll find it over on, uh, uh, there's another uh, two places for sure. campus in Berwick. And um, I'll have to give, get the ad address to that one. And then the, the new establishment that's coming up here up north is at 11800 uh, Eastfield Road. That'll uh, be open up in That'll September. start in September. Mm -hmm. So um, we we witnessed the power of God at work. And, and our pastor, uh, Kelvin Smith, has the anointing of God to deliver the word of God. Yes. And he has a heart for making the church a house of mm -hmm. prayer for all people. Yes, he does. That is not about him. Mm -hmm. But it's about advancing the kingdom of God through he what through the mm -hmm. process he called of living on target. Yes. And that's like my husband says, that is living in love and service to God mm -hmm. first, to your right. family, then to the church, and then to the world. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh is we going into Zach? Uh, we, we are. We are at um all that Jesus taught part I thought forty one. 41. But we got 41, um, but it's 40 on the paper, so. Okay, so uh, we're going to uh, bring Brother uh, Zach's teaching on, and we also ad admonish you to visit um, charlottechristianfellowship.org, mm -hmm. where you can uh, download or get in contact with the other teachings, 1 through 40. If you've missed it, uh, you've got... Uh, we've got a link to him on, on our website. We also have another link to Brother uh, Gary Linton, yes. who uh, we are really thankful to the Lord for, who got, actually got us um, uh, qualified to serve 
uh, not qualified, God made us qualified, mm -hmm. but he watched over us and nurtured us as we were preparing ourselves to ministry. And so we thank God for him and his wife. Yes. Um, they're with uh, Ministry Maker Ministries, and um, he has wonderful resources that are oh, available yes. Oh, yes. Uh, to powerful. teach powerful, I mean, a, a powerhouse of, yes. of uh, resources yes. that's made available as well. So, And, and also, before we start, I always ask you this one thing. This ministry, get your principal paper, please. Oh, yeah. Always do not sit down without pencil and paper, okay? Mm -hmm. Because nobody has all the answers, but together God says two or more come together in his name that he'd be in the midst of us. So therefore, if you, you have a question, the Lord, I'm telling the Holy Spirit will answer our question. Yes, he will. We, we, we have faith he's gonna do it, and we'll be able to use it to walk out his salvation, to walk out the word of God, which he's asking us to do, to encourage one another, to yeah. build our houses up, and to love on one another, to love the brothers and sisters in Christ. So uh, uh, we look forward to uh, actually going to, in the Jesus' name that he would watch over this equipment that it would not uh, fail us and go through any of the uh, breakdowns, but we trust in the Lord that he would do it and that the word will come forth and that you would understand Amen. in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Remember that promise to be with us always to the end of the age is given specifically to those who teach others to do everything that Jesus commanded. And so that's why it's important for us to go through the Gospels to discover all that Jesus taught. Otherwise, we will not know. And if we don't know it, we won't be able to do it ourselves. And then we won't be able to teach others. There's a difference between teaching people something and teaching people to do something. When we teach people to something, it is just like explaining something on the blackboard. You could teach swimming on a blackboard without knowing swimming yourself. But to teach people to do would be to actually go to the river and show them how to swim. So when Jesus <laughs> taught us, told us to teach others to do, it means that we have to do it ourselves first. And that's the principle in which Jesus himself lived. If you see Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, it says there in Acts 1 verse 1 that the first account, which is the Gospel of Luke, which Luke wrote first before he wrote Acts of the Apostles, he tells Theophilus the title for that Gospel of Luke is All That Jesus Began to Do and Then to Teach. So he first did and then taught. And if Luke were to give a similar title to the Acts of the Apostles, it would be all that Jesus continued to do and to teach. Luke's gospel was what Jesus began to do and to teach in his physical body. And Acts of the Apostles is what Jesus continued to do and teach in his spiritual body. Again, the doing must come first. So keeping that in mind, we continue with our study. We reached the end of Matthew 10 in our last episode. And now we come to Matthew chapter 11 and verse 1. And it says here that it came about that when Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, and that's what we studied in our last couple of sessions, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. You see something of the tireless nature with which Jesus served during those three and a half years ministry. He never took a vacation. He was constantly on the go with this burden to complete uh, the ministry the Father had given him to complete on this earth. And every true servant of God will have that same passion. Jesus taught us by his life to be tireless in our service for God. It says he went about teaching and preaching in all the cities. And then we read when John the Baptist was in prison and he heard about the works of Christ, he sent word through his disciples and said to Christ, are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else? Now, this is interesting because later on, John, uh, Jesus says that John the Baptist is the greatest man born of women and the greatest prophet ever up until that time. And yet this man who was the greatest prophet had doubts. 
about the Christ, whether Jesus was the Messiah, even though he had seen those supernatural signs at Jesus' baptism, the dove coming down, the voice from heaven, and the sense in his own spirit that this was the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. So why did this doubt come into John's mind? First of all, remember that he was under the old covenant. We cannot compare ourselves with him because in the new covenant, we have the Holy Spirit and we have um, many privileges which people under the old covenant just didn't have. So we're not here to compare ourselves with him. But the reason is that when John was in prison, he expected Jesus to be able to deliver him. He expected God to deliver him from prison because he had faithfully fulfilled his ministry. Why was God allowing him to be in prison? Now, Paul never had that type of question when Paul was in prison. Peter didn't have that type of question when he was in prison, not because they were better than John the Baptist, but because they had the Holy Spirit. And that's why we must never compare ourselves with Old Testament saints and prophets when we see the mistakes they made, even David committing adultery. Remember, he was under the Old Covenant. Many Christians don't understand the distinct difference between Old Covenant and New Covenant. The privilege we have of being filled with the Holy Spirit today from within, which they never had in the Old Covenant. When it says John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb, it was only upon him. The Spirit of God was upon John, but not within. Today we have the Spirit within. In the Old Covenant, there was a veil between the soul and the Spirit. So the spirit could not penetrate through that into man's spirit and dwell within. The spirit could only be upon people and flow over them and be a blessing perhaps to thousands. But in the new covenant, the spirit comes because the veil has been rent between the soul and the spirit. Man can have God dwelling right within his spirit. And from within, the inner, from the innermost being, the rivers of living water flow. That's the difference. So we read here that John the Baptist had this doubt because the spirit was not within him. And so he wondered, why am I still in prison? I'm supposed to be the forerunner of Christ and I want to complete my ministry. Well, he didn't realize that he had completed his ministry. And so when he asked this question to, John, to Jesus, are you really the Messiah? Jesus doesn't say to him, don't you remember what you saw at the baptism? No. He understands the struggle people under the old covenant had. And he says, go and report to John what you hear and see. How the blind receive sight, the lame are walking, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. That's the greatest of all, you know, in ascending order, blind receiving sight and the lame walking, the lepers cleansed the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the greatest of all the poor have the gospel preached to them so the lord was saying here are the signs that prove that i am the messiah so we see clearly that all these signs mentioned in verse 5 were not necessarily to be repeated throughout the christian era that throughout 2000 years Christians would go around giving all blind people sight and making all deaf people hear and make all lep cleanse all lepers and raise all dead people. That's not the meaning. These were specific signs that were meant to endorse the fact that Christ was the, Jesus was the Messiah himself. And he makes it very clear here because that was the question, how do we know you're the Messiah? It's important for us to understand what Jesus was teaching here so that we don't live under the false illusion that a lot of Christians live today, that every single Christian who is sick must be healed. It doesn't work, and preachers who preach that are leading others into a deception. So remember, these were the signs that endorsed the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. And then he goes on to say in verse 6, Blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me, who doesn't get offended, with something I do or don't do. It's very easy for Christians to be offended when 
they expect God to do something and he does not do them, do it. For example, here in John the Baptist's case, he was expecting Christ to deliver him from prison. It didn't happen as he anticipated or expected. And he was disappointed and um, offended perhaps. And it's in this connection that the Lord is saying, blessed is he who never gets offended with me. It's one of the things that Jesus taught that we need to practice in our own life that whether God does not do what we expect or does something which we don't expect, that we don't get offended because we believe that he is sovereign and he knows what is best for us. We don't know it ourselves, but he knows what is best and he will do what is best for his children. And then as they were going away in Matthew 11, 7, then Jesus began to speak to the multitudes about John and said to them, what did you go out into the wilderness to look at? Were you looking for a reed shaken by the wind, you know, an unsteady sort of person like many preachers are? They bend in whichever way the wind is blowing. You know, the Lord was saying, is this type of person you went to see? You may have seen many preachers, he says. He implies, who are moved by the wind of public opinion. If people are craving for something, the reed moves that way. Today we read of uh, seeker-friendly churches. Mm -hmm. And they are trying to say that they are fulfilling Christ's ministry of being the friend of sinners. But you don't become the friend of sinners by compromising your convictions. Right. Because then you're not a friend of sinners at all because you don't deliver them from their sin and their worldliness. Mm -hmm. So seeker-friendly churches and seeker-friendly attitudes result in compromise of our convictions. And we become like reeds that are swaying with the wind. If the wind blows to the left, we move to the left. The wind blows to the right, we move to the right. And we see so much of that today. We see, for example, a craze suddenly beginning of people falling down on the ground and laughing uncontrollably. And then other preachers see it and say, hey, this is the way things are going. So we better manipulate and produce that in our congregation as well. And then after a while, you see someone laying hands on somebody and pushing them down somewhere, usually in the West somewhere. And then you find in many third world countries, people begin to imitate that and say, hey, this is the way we should be doing it. This is the way for popularity. Or you hear someone else talking about the prosperity gospel or healing. And they begin to think, okay, that's what we must be preaching now. And then they begin to sway that way. These are not prophets of God. These are people who preach to those who want their ears tickled, seeker-friendly people, uh, messages that are meant to please man. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians 1 verse 10, if I seek to please men, I cannot be the servant of Christ. It's very, very important to remember that, that if I ever seek to please human beings, I can never be the servant of Jesus Christ. It's a fundamental principle. It's not that I can be an inferior servant. I cannot be a servant at all. A man has to choose when he wants to preach God's word, whether he's going to be a servant of God or a servant of the people. He should not be like a, ray, a reed swayed by the wind or shaken by the wind. God wants people who are upright, like firm trees rooted in the ground, that even a storm will not shake. And so he says, did you go out to see one of these regular preachers that you've seen in your synagogues out there in the wilderness? No, not at all. Then what did you go out to see? Did you go out to see a man dressed in soft clothing? Because all those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. In other words, he said, did you expect to go and see a preacher who is dressed in the latest style with branded suits and very expensive clothes made by the most expensive tailors. He said, these people are not true servants of God. They just collect tithes from the poor people, buy expensive clothes and cars and houses for themselves. He said, those are not true prophets. There are plenty of them today. And we need these warnings today. 
about what Jesus considered to be the mark of a true prophet. But what did you go out to see? To see a prophet? Well, I'll tell you something. Yes, but one who is more than a prophet. It's amazing that Jesus referred to Jesus, John the Baptist as someone who was more than a prophet. I mean, in the Old Testament, the prophet was the greatest uh, servant of God who expressed God's mind. What does it mean to be greater than a prophet? And he says, because this is the one about whom it is written, I send my messenger before my face who will prepare your way before you. All the prophets prophesied about the coming of Christ. But John the Baptist was unique. He came to actually prepare the way just before the Messiah came. He was the last of the prophets of the Old Covenant and had the unique privilege of preparing the way for the arrival of the Messiah. Because he's the one who preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is now at hand. None of the Old Testament prophets preached the kingdom of heaven. They preached the kingdom of earth. That if you honor God, God will give you the land of Canaan. And he will deliver you from your earthly enemies. And he will kill the giants in Canaan. And he'll give you rain from heaven and bless and prosper you. And he'll heal you of your sicknesses. These are the things the Old Testament prophets prophesied. But John the Baptist preached the kingdom of heaven. He says, you've got to repent. You've got to turn around from living for these earthly things. And something new is coming. The Messiah is now coming. And he's not going to deliver you from the Romans. He's going to deliver you from sin. And he's not going to help you to have a beautiful land better than the land of Canaan. He's going to lead you to a heavenly life on this earth. You're not going to get much of this earth with this new message, but you're going to get all of heaven. So in that sense, he was the greatest prophet of all. And that's why he said, he's more than a prophet, one who is going to prepare the way before me. And he said, goes on to say in verse 11, Truly I say to you, among those who are born of women, there is not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, but the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That's an amazing statement. We who belong to the kingdom of heaven are greater than John the Baptist, have the potential to be greater than John the Baptist. It's an amazing statement. John the Baptist was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And we can be greater even than him. In what way? Because he could only say, get ready for the kingdom of heaven is near. Whereas we can say, the kingdom of heaven has come. It's right here. Now we can enter in and we can live this heavenly life right now. Whereas John, John the Baptist could not lead people into a heavenly life. He could only prepare the way. And that is the way in which we have a greater ministry than even him. Because he could only say Christ is coming. Now we say Christ has come, risen, ascended. And you can receive him into your life. You can receive the Holy Spirit into your life and come into a glorious new life. This is what we preach. And also, John the Baptist had the Spirit upon him, whereas we can have the Spirit within us, not on top of us, like every old covenant prophet, including John the Baptist, upon, but within. This is a very fundamental difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. If we are only interested in ministry, then we need the Spirit upon us. The Old Testament people had a tremendous ministry with the Spirit upon them. But it didn't change their inner life. Samson blessed Israel in many ways, but his inner life was full of lust. Even David delivered Israel from many of its enemies, but he was defeated within his life by sexual lust. That's not to be true. For any servant of God, in the new covenant. So when you hear of a preacher today falling into adultery or some other sin, he's living like an Old Testament person, even if he's been be a blessing to millions. Well, a lot of people in the Old Testament prophets were a blessing to many, many people. But the Spirit was not within them. So in that sense, we are greater than John the Baptist. It doesn't mean that 
every Christian is more wholehearted. What it means is there's greater potential. And uh, like, for example, if we had to compare ourselves in the mathematical field, because we have access to computers today, we can do calculations far better and quicker than great mathematicians who lived 100 years ago. It doesn't mean that we are greater mathematicians than them. Mm. It means we have got greater resources. And because we have greater resources, we can do some things which those great minds who lived 100 years ago could not do. So if you compare yourself with Albert Einstein, who was one of the greatest geniuses in the 20th century, we can do calculations faster than him. Not because we are cleverer than him, but because we have certain access to certain gadgets like computers, which he didn't have access to. So it's in that way that he's saying that the least in the kingdom of heaven can, is greater than John the Baptist. Little, little boy using a computer today can calculate things faster than the great scientist Albert Einstein. And with the potential we have in the new covenant, we can rise higher than John the Baptist in our, in our life. We, for example, in this particular uh, matter of doubt as to is Jesus the Messiah, we can come to a life where we never doubt whether Jesus is our Savior or not. Even if we are in prison for years. I mean, we know of great saints of God in many lands where they were persecuted for the faith and they were imprisoned for many years, 10, 15 years, but they never lost their faith. They never asked the type of question that John the Baptist asked, it's not because they were greater, wholehear more wholehearted than John the Baptist. It's because they had the Holy Spirit within them. So this is the meaning of Matthew 11, 11. And so we must not uh, misuse this verse. We must not also come short of what God's expectation is in the new covenant. He wants every one of us to rise higher than John the Baptist in our inner life. What a challenge that is. You cannot imagine John the Baptist running after women or running after money. And a Christian who claims to be under the new covenant should be way above that. And when they're not, they're sinking below even old covenant saints. It's foolish to say that we're in the new covenant when we live at a lower standard than people in the old covenant. And he explains that, and from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. Because all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. So he was saying John was the dividing line between old covenant and new covenant. The law and the prophets, which is the Old Testament and the old covenant, was right up to John. And John marked that dividing line. And from that time onwards, it's the kingdom of heaven that is preached, not the kingdom of earth. If your mind is set on earthly things and that's what you're preaching is an earthly message of prosperity and healing, I want to say you are more than 2,000 years outdated. That is an old covenant message from Deuteronomy 28. It is not the message of Ephesians 1.3, which says we are blessed with all yes. spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Yes. It's not the message of Ephesians 2 which says that we're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. This is the message we're supposed to preach to the kingdom of heaven, which has already come. And one last thing we see here is Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. Now, basically Christians are people of peace. We don't fight with human beings. We concentrate on fighting the devil. The Old Testament saints fought with human beings, but not us. We fight with Satan. And here we read, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. What does that mean? It's inward violence against Satan and against the flesh. The lusts in our flesh, we fight with them. And violently, this is the mark of those who are seeking the kingdom of heaven. And these are the ones who get the kingdom of heaven. Many people do not possess the riches of God's kingdom because inwardly, they are not violent against the lusts in their flesh and against satanic attempts to tempt them, to make them fall. So remember this, it's speaking about wholehearted people. 
the kingdom of heaven is possessed by men of violence and this may be the reason why some of you have not able to do not have not come into this heavenly life so far you're not a person of violence in your inner life against your own lusts you're not a person who's radical in by in a violent attitude towards satanic temptations that come your way unfortunately many christians are more violent in their speech and behavior towards other people very often to other christians these people are old covenant people or probably not even converted a new covenant person never is violent against human beings never a person who fights with his wife or husband is not a new covenant person at all a new covenant person is one who does violence in his inner man to the lusts in his flesh and towards satanic temptation such people possess the kingdom this is what the lord is emphasizing here we'll continue the study in our next episode amen Powerful words, Mr. Davis. That's discipleship. Oh, that's some good stuff. <laughs> that's discipleship. That is total. Well, that's a tool of discipleship. Discipleship requires a relationship. True. And, uh, and that's what this the discipleship teaching us mm -hmm. how to how to apply. Okay, so that's what that's we're right. talking about. Uh, when we're talking about discipleship, it's first got to be first partakers. Then we're partaking now. Mm -hmm. Then we can go ahead and share what we you know, learn. But and, and even though you heard the word, now you got to be partakers of what you heard. Yes. Then you share. Okay, don't just go repeat like a parrot what you just heard. Because if you ain't doing it, <laughs> you know, uh, by our fruit, people who see Christ in us. Not by what we say, okay? Uh, this is some powerful, powerful, powerful stuff we just heard. Um, um, I, I just love the uh, uh, the word that we just heard. It's so powerful. Would you like to start off, Mrs. Davis, and uh, some of the things you heard first, or would you like me to start? Yeah. Because um, I know sometimes you said that you lose train of thought if I do that to you. Um, as he started out talking about Jesus worked tirelessly to fulfill the will of the Father. Mm -hmm. And um, yesterday during my, uh, when I was, you know, during my quiet time with the Lord, um, I asked him about that. And it's, it's really uh, wonderful that um, Brother Zach covered that in this particular session. And, you know, I, I really don't want to... I want to use the time that God has given me on this planet wisely, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. But I have this, this longing to, to do the work of God, to do the will of God more than anything mm -hmm. else, probably more than eating or, you know, any of those kind of things. And, and, and it's funny, and I'm asking him, you know, what is that? Why is that that my every waking thought is, you know, how, how, or what I could do to advance the kingdom of God today. What can I do to be a blessing to someone today or whatever it is like that. And so when he was talking about how Jesus worked tirelessly to fulfill the will of God, he did not retire from that. From the, the, the space of time that his ministry was, he used his every waking moment to fulfill the will of the Father. Um, wisdom, um, I wrote down here, disciples who follow Jesus do the same thing. They work tirelessly to fulfill God's will in the earth. And wisdom tells us when to take an aside. Okay? So, in other words, Jesus, he did take a break. Okay? He'd go, to, go away from his disciples up in the mountain or wherever you know, wherever he, he, he pulled aside uh, for some, some rest and relaxation time, even in the boat, he went to sleep, you see. So um, there is balance to what that statement says, that he worked tirelessly, but he had wisdom enough to know when it was time to take a break. And that's what, you know, that was my, my, my cry to God, to help me to have that balance 
that, you know, even though my heart's running after fulfilling the will of God, that I don't lose, you know, act foolishly and don't realize it's also a time that I need to take some time, some downtime. Amen. Amen. Well, you was talking just then. And, uh, I was thinking about uh, Zach was talking about Brother John the Baptist. And um, I was looking at Malachi. Malachi, the, uh, the last chapter, I think, is six and uh, verse five. Five and six. Now, remember, Christ says, um, who John the Baptist was, and he said, "There's no Malachi five. What's is it six? Last, what's the last Malachi? I mean, Four. Right before Matthew. What's Matthew? Right before Matthew, the book before Matthew. Um, oh. it is Malachi. But what I'm saying is, hold on, let me just help you out. Malachi four. Yeah, Malachi four. And then we're going to verse five. Okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Jesus said um, that John the Baptist had the spirit of Elijah. Okay, so he said, as a matter of fact, he actually said, he said, look, I'm sending you a prophet, Elijah, before the great day, the dreadful day of the Lord, of, of the Lord's arrival. And I'm reading from the uh, New Living Translation, okay? Uh, his preaching would turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land uh, with a curse. Uh, these things already happen. They're happening, okay? Um, in the last days, the Bible tells us it would be uh, father against son, or mother against daughter, or brother against uh, brother, husband against wife. This land that uh, the Lord says that um, before he comes back, these are things that's been going on. And those are things that are happening right now. Um, what I'm getting to is this. The Holy Spirit that uh, uh, we just mentioned, just saying John was in the New Testament, but he was an Old Testament prophet. Okay, and we are fortunate to have the Holy Spirit living in us. The Holy Spirit was on, on them. Now he lives in us. The word is, I forget what verse it is, but my wife might help me out there. He says uh, that he will come and sup with us and uh, the Holy Spirit will live in us. And if the Holy Spirit comes, then he will come. If he comes, the Father will come and they will dwell in us. So they will live in us, not outside of us, in us. This is Revelation. In Revelation? I think it is when he says, I'll stand at the door and knock. Mm -hmm. And if you let me in, I'll come in and my Father will. Amen. Okay, I think that's what it is. Amen. So we, we had opportunities. The, the, my wife used to say uh, the, uh, the Old Testament is like a, a, a picture, a, a forefront of what's going to, or what's going to happen. We have a, a picture of it. We're actually living in, inside the, the New Testament. We're actually living in the New Testament. We're living. We're, we're actually the, the ones that said make disciples. We're actually the disciples that you're talking about making. We're, we're those is mentioned in the Bible. We're those who are to carry the word of Christ. We're those who he's called. They said, I will prepare you. We're those who he's preparing. So we take it personal and we, we, we know that he says, even inside his head, he says, he tells us each one teach one. He tells women to teach the younger women, the older women teach the younger women, the older men teach the young men. We're those people. We're those people. But what we want to do but we won't take uh, responsibility for our, our action. And we say, well, we read it in the Bible. But we're actually the ones that we're reading about, that we're to do the work. And he's given us the job description of what we ought to do as his disciples. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but the, uh, the other thing I say about um, how you can compare what's going on in the Old Testament and the New is that the Old Testament represents a physical representation of man's relationship with God. Okay, you can read the stories about how God interacted with men back in those days, okay, in a, in a physical sense, like Brother Zach was saying. But today, this new covenant that we're under, he does in a spiritual, there's a spiritual operation that's going on. 
in, in us. And I want to read from um, Hebrews, the eighth chapter, to kind of uh, give a little context to what, what Jesus is trying to say um, in this. I mean, what, what Paul was trying to reveal to us Hebrews. that Hebrews, the eighth chapter, I'm going to start reading at um, verse six in the Amplified. Okay. And it says, but um, as it is, Christ has acquired a priestly ministry, which is more excellent than the old Levitical priestly ministry. Okay, like he was saying, people are still trying to live out Deuteronomy 28. But here the word declares to us, Jesus has something that's more excellent than that. Because he is the mediator or arbiter of a better covenant, which unites God and man. Okay? In the Old Testament, God's up here, man's down here, all right? God says, man does, okay? But today, we have God with us. Amen. God in us, okay? And if I'm not mistaken, the scripture says, it is God doing the work in us yes. to fulfill his purpose. Amen, baby. Listen, that's a better plan than the old one because these men had to try to fulfill stuff that was just monumental. Moses said, Lord, you want me to do what? Go tell you. He said, I can't talk mm -hmm. to them people. You know, mm -hmm. he, he knew there's no way I can do that. Same thing with Gideon. He told Gideon, you're going to do this. And he said, wait a minute, mighty man or what? Valor, me? <laughs> you talking about me? Uh-uh. But see, God says, let me finish reading this. God uh, you're not, Jesus united God and man, which has been enacted and rests on better promises, better promises than Deuteronomy 28, which says you'll be the head and not to tell you, be above and not beneath, okay? All of those things sounded good, but the promises that Jesus gives us are more than that. He says, listen, I'm going to let you be, I'm going to let you share in some of my attributes. Look at this. He says, you're going to be on earth and in heaven at the same time. Mm. Mm. I mean, listen, how can you wrap your mind around that? But that's what we, we who are believers and followers of Christ, while yet on this planet, are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Amen. Ephesians says. And then it says he's given us every spiritual blessing, not some of them all of them. And then Peter goes on to say that you have been given everything that pertains to life and godliness and you lack nothing. Mm -hmm. We haven't been able to wrap our minds around it because we don't live like that. Amen. We don't live like uh, like like these promises Big are. Curious. Exactly. Are ours, but they are. Mm -hmm. And what God is desiring to do is bring us into the knowledge of that truth. Not the Old Testament truth of trying to keep laws and regulations, but the finished work has already been accomplished by Jesus Christ. John the Baptist, uh, the other thing Jesus was saying, I don't want y'all to be offended in me when he was talking about, uh, you know, go tell John mm -hmm. what you see. Well, listen, Jesus was telling them, go tell John that Isaiah 61 is being, is being fulfilled. <laughs> and if you read the Old Testament about what the prophecy said, Jesus said, here it is happening right before your eyes. Yeah. Tell him what you see. Amen. Okay, and so then Jesus said, well, look, but I don't want you all to be offended at me. And when I read that chapter, I would say, you know what? Most of the people knew that Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins. Okay, and here it is. Jesus, right, here it is. Jesus talking about how great John the Baptist is, but, at, but he won't go get him out of prison. Mm -hmm. He won't go break him out, you see. You know, Jesus said, I don't want you to be offended at me because I'm not going to do that. I come to do the will of my father. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what I do. And that's what we're all called to do. Despite what people may think about why we do a thing. If we're doing what God has called us to do, you got to stick with that. You see what I'm saying? So God, Jesus said, I don't want y'all to be offended because I'm not going to go break John out of prison. Cause you, you know, you know, they looked at him as the great deliverer. You know, you the you supposed to be the Messiah and you supposed to, you supposed to be able to do some, some things to these Romans and, and go get John out of jail. No, no, no. That's not what, because he, 
he knew that later on he wasn't gonna come down off the cross. Amen. He was gonna stay up there. And 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 what she's saying, I want y'all to understand. Uh, we can do the same thing. We can. What John did, ask Jesus a question. He couldn't do personal sin his, 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 uh, his disciples to ask Jesus a question. We can do that too. We can ask Jesus yes. a question. Yes. Don't don't think that our God don't love us to answer. Says if you ask anything in my name, why won't you ask Jesus? What's the problem with us yes. going to ask Jesus? He said, "He's there for us, but we won't do it." Then let me tell you the other part of it. He'll answer you. Yes, he will. Now that's you don't understand. We have a living God that you can ask questions, and He'll answer you too. He'll but you gotta have answer. an ear to hear. That's what He said. Let Him have ears. And <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you this for a reason. Because most of us don't want to ask him because we want to stay in the darkness. We want to do our own thing. You know, we obviously, well, I got plenty of time, you know, before I come, turn to the Lord. Well, let me tell you this. The Lord says this. He's been patient with us. Yes, he is. He's been patient Thank with every you. one of us down here on this earth. Thank you, Father. I mean, the, the earth actually cries out. You know, and the revelation of the book says that you have people up under the stairs, those, that's up under the stairs morning and, and saying, when Lord, when Lord. Jesus said this, when he come back, he's gonna come like a thief in the night. You, you see, so nobody knows when thief is ready, all you be prepared. You see, so the, this is what we're doing. We're, we're crying out the same thing John the Baptist did. He's telling you who you are. We're telling you have access, Christ says you have access to the Father. Yes. Because, of his, because of his blood that he shared Yes. You have access, so there's no reason why you won't turn to Christ unless you, you just, the word says you love the darkness that you're in. Mm -hmm. We ain't talking about the light, the sunlight. We're talking about the darkness, the light that you need. Yes. That, that you think you can have from Christ. But let me tell you something. The book of life says everything is written, even your motives are written down in that book. So one day, one day, this is going to be a, a choice that you're going to receive. And this is what the word of God is going to say to you. Welcome home, my good and faithful servant. Or depart from me, I know you not. You mm -hmm. see, and the ones who he sent it to God, those people said, depart from me, I know you not. You know who those, those are so-called Christians? So when I did this and I did that, and I did this and I did that. But he said, why do you tell those people to depart from me? Because they did it out of their heart. They did it not out of their heart, but the works, dead works, mm -hmm. you see? And those dead works and stuff, Christ works through us, so he gets the glory. When you did it, when you got, Lord told you to depart from it because you got your reward when you were down on earth for doing the things you did. You got all this uh, uh, steeds uh, uh, stood up when you came in the room and the, the, the clock when you started speaking. You know, you, 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 they gave you all the tithes and offerings. You didn't give to Christ. Or God, you built your high house and your cars and stuff and listen to the mighty way and nobody knows what you're doing. See, God knows our motive. God knows our hearts. We can have people down here that we can't have from God. Mm -hmm. You cannot. And the thing of, uh, if you read Psalm 51, there's one thing that God revealed to me about David's heart. David didn't try to hide the truth, okay? He knew, and, and mm -hmm. then he Do acknowledged it. it, okay? When you yes, acknowledge, it's one thing to say, I'm sorry, without acknowledging your sin. Okay, David went further than just to, this, just to say, I'm sorry, forgive me. He says, I acknowledge my sin. And that's where we drop the ball. We will not acknowledge our sin. We got animosity in our heart. You know, that, that we, we, know, we know it's there, but we'll call it something else to ourselves against another person. God knows exactly what it is. You can try to sugarcoat it all you want, all to, we want to, but when you find yourself with joy for people and you know, not giving them your best and, 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 and all that kind of a thing. There's a reason to that. And at the root of it is unforgiveness or some hurt or whatever it is that you, that you have not dealt with. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, God sees it. Yeah. And so what he wants to do is to bear our hearts before us. He wants you to see. He already see it. He wants to see and say, sister, let me tell you, the reason why you don't want to go over there and help that lady is because you don't like what she did to you. And instead of you going to her and you all uh, trying to talk through it, you hold animosity and say, no, nah, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I want to do that, you know. But God knows the intent of your heart 
is because you don't like something that somebody did to you. So therefore you withhold the gift God gave you. You don't withhold it from her just because they, they hurt you or, or you couldn't get your way or whatever it was like that. God have mercy on us. Now, what she just saying, remember that, suppose, that let's, let's put into the, the part where Christ says, well, I, I, I don't hold your sins against you. He gave us grace and mercy. But the same thing he given us, he acting us against those who offended us. The same thing. The same thing. Same thing. You want him to forgive you? Read your word. The word says you you can't be forgiven. You come up with your hands full of dirt and stuff like that. So I'm going to hold on to this. Say, remember the rich man in the Bible who said that uh, the house is dead. He went to the, uh, the king and said, look, man, uh, look, I can't pay the debt. What the king do? Forgive him. All that money. Then he leaves there and finds somebody else that had it. Then owe him about a like hundred dollars. He owes him five million. Five million forgiven. This man owed five dollars. Five dollars. And when he ran into the man, and said, "Hey, give my money." Well, jump on the man. Call the police. Put the man in jail. But the people around seen. Just like you think you don't see, people don't see what you're doing. People around seen, and people say you get blessed. Then all of a sudden you act like all oh, you mighty than the mm -hmm. all that stuff. People see that. You think they're not praying for you? What are they praying to the Lord? Go forgive it. What did he ask the Lord forgive you for? For you acting the way you're doing. So they're asking God to forgive you. But remember something. The Bible says God has the final word. Yes, the final word. He has the final word. So today, if you have or you are or you're doing something and you, you know it's wrong or you're holding an offense against your brother man, let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit's inside of you speaking to you. You don't know today. There's a man that got rich. The Bible talks about a rich man. And he, the, the Lord said today, I forget, it's the Old Testament. The guy said, well, look, uh, Lord, give me five more years or something like that. Remember, was going to die. And Hezekiah. The, the, who was it? Hezekiah. You know, and so we're actually talking about, you can talk to the Lord and go over and answer you. But this man had get his affairs in order. God will allow you to get your affairs in order. But, but, let me tell you something. When you go before the Lord and you stick out his tongue on you, you're holding an animal. He can't get into heaven. Liars, thieves, all that stuff. The Bible tells you what's not going to enter. The Bible tells you. So you can say you forgave someone or you forgive people and then you haven't. That's a liar. <laughs> That's called lying. We ain't got to sit out your mouth, but you're still doing it. So you're lying. Who are you lying to? You're lying to the person because you tell the person, I forgive you, baby. It's all cool. But in your heart, you have it. God sees the heart. That's see. right. And you can tell. Let me tell you this, and I'll tell, uh, t usually tell people this. If you want to know why people act a certain way in a situation, you look at the root because the root is the part that's hidden. And you see that they are withdrawing themselves from people, certain people, let's just say that. Uh -huh, you sorry. know, they don't, they don't want to, uh, you know, when they're asked to do something, you know, they'll find every kind of reason why they can't or why they shouldn't or anything like that. You know what I'm saying? And, and the Bible tells us that if, a, if, if the man on the road comes and asks you to walk, to walk a mile with him, Jesus said, walk two with him. Don't just go one. But, but we won't do that. Well, that right there is the fruit of what's going on in that person's heart. There is something that they have not forgiven, some animosity that they're holding against somebody for whatever reason, and that is the evidence because they will not give of themselves. And so listen to this same scripture where my husband was sharing with you about the man who was forgiven much, and then he wanted to take, put a man in jail for a little bit because this is what frightened me and what should frighten you when Jesus tells his stories. He said, uh, you know, should you not, and I'm reading from Matthew 18, you know, he's, let me, let me start at the beginning. Matthew 18? Mm-hmm. Let me go through the Matthew 18. I like that. Matthew 18. Okay. 18. Okay, I'm going to start reading at verse uh, 22. 22. Jesus answered, I say unto you, not to put, not up to, when, um, the question was, how many times am I supposed to forgive my brother? And this is what Peter was asking Jesus, and he responded to him. I say, not only seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the accounting, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But because he could not repay, his master ordered him to be sold and his wife and his children and everything he possessed and the payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees and begged him saying, have patience with me. I will repay you everything. And his master's heart was moved with compassion and he released him and forgave him, canceling the debt. Okay. But 
that same slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and he seized him and began choking him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow slave fell on his knees and begged him earnestly, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling. And he went and had him thrown into prison until he paid back the debt. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were grieved and they went and reported to the master with clarity and detail, everything that had taken place. Then his master called him and said to him, you wicked and contemptible slave. I forgave all that great debt of yours because you begged me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave who owed you a little by comparison as I had mercy on you? And in wrath, his master turned him over to the torturers. Did you hear that? Turn him over to the torturers now that's a whole until he paid all that he owed. My heavenly father, Jesus said, will also do the same thing to you mm -hmm. if you don't forgive your brother. If that don't shake you up, mm. if that don't make you want to cry out before God, Lord, fine. If there's any animosity I have toward anybody Amen. in my heart, because the torturers are demons. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's right. They are the one who are the torturers that come in and mess up your mind, mess up your finances, mess up your family household. You can't wonder, you can't figure out why your boss is always on your back and all this other kind of stuff. You got the torturers messing with you, buddy, because something in your heart you have held against somebody. I don't care what it was. You, they may not have done things the way you wanted them to do it or said something to you in a sly way or whatever it is like that. Whatever it is they did, they did to offend you, you have not forgiven them. And I would pray in Jesus' name that you would go before the Father, lay yourself prostrate and ask him, Lord, reveal to me, that, am I doing that? Because I don't want no torturers to take over my life. And let me tell you, that's not the only place that God did that. God was sent evil spirit. In the book, I was the, uh, like the first Samuel. But Saul, the Holy Spirit left him. He was disobedient to the Lord. And the Holy Spirit left him. And the Holy Spirit, he, the, the, the Lord actually sent a, 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 a torture. Well, he was tortured. That's when David was playing songs for him to ease his, uh, his pain, you know, his, his suffering and stuff. Because the Lord will do that too. Now, the reason I say things like this to you is the same thing my wife was saying. When the Holy Spirit is with you and then you turn on God, because that's what you're turning on. If you, if you know God, and then you're walking with him, and then you decide to leave him, then you you know also know that there's, a, there's God, so there's got to be a devil. And if you turn from God willingly, or, you know, when you've been walking on this time, you're going to be tortured. The, the, the things of this world, you'll realize they'll fade away, and you'll go through these things. But because if, what happens? You get, you get a, hit the lottery number. You turn away from God. You get the woman you you love. You turn away from God. Got what I want now. Turn away from God. Then you you uh, get a promotion. You got turn away from God. What happened? Ah ah ah. When those things go to happen to you, you've turned away from God. You ain't got to shut your mouth. Your actions is louder than your words. Let me say you something. When when you, these are the fruits, I, I read about the fruits of the spirit many times. This first time I thought about what he read today inside of Matthew, I think five or six. The works that the Holy Spirit did, Christ did, those things, those five things, he said, uh, go and tell John. He healed the, uh, what is it? The, the healed the sick, the lame are being, uh, uh, are walking, the blind is seeing. All yeah. these things that you see happening. See, those are the things you see that, that shows godly things. God, are you the one wounding these people? Are you the one blocking these people from hearing from God because of your hatred and stuff, this false gospel you're teaching? The way that you say, well, I love the Lord, but you're treating people and doing things that's brown to you and stuff. Is your heart wicked and saying, well, I love the Lord, and your hands folded to it. Come to the Lord, your face is evil, and you got a knife, a spiritual knife, and you make a stab them in the back. Are you looking at other people's wives or, or husbands? These things, I tell you, God is in control of everything. We can hide from everybody, deceive people, stuff, because God, but God looks at the heart. You see, yes. and so that's what we got to get right. Ask the Lord today to search you. And anything in us is not pleasing to him. This is the time to ask him to, to, to remove it from you. He's already forgiven you. Honestly, he can ask you, you got to 
you read the Bible, to confess out your mouth. You got to confess it, my Lord, I, don't, I, I want you to come into my heart, into my life. You know, I, I want to, you to serve you. You got to open, and then you got to mean what you're saying. It ain't right. to say you ain't going to fail someone. It ain't to say you ain't going to sin no more. But the thing is, you got to mean it because then you got to fight and going on. The Holy Spirit will help you fight that fight of faith. You see? Yeah. But if you don't, you try to do it on your own. You yeah, you can't do it on your own. You're this is what you got to realize. Time. As a human being, you don't have the wherewithal to, to, to live out what God is asking you to live out. That's what happened in the Old Testament. They thought they could keep the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. You see, pride tells you that you can, but I'm going to tell you that you can't. But with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes to enable you to do the will of God. And this is the part that we do. We hear the Holy Spirit bring a truth to our heart, and we harden our, heart, harden our hearts and our ears. Mm -hmm. We don't listen to them, and we want to grieve in the Holy Spirit. I like what you did. Do that again. You see what I'm harden saying? Harden your hearts and your ears. That's right. Because the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart. I mean, there's a connection here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In his heart. That was spiritual stuff now. You see what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is that you have to realize that when the Holy Spirit convicts you of your evil, he will do it. He's identifying that evil in you. Do like David did. David says, Lord, I acknowledge that sin. I'm not going to argue with God and say, no, that's not really what it is. I just, I just know I should be doing this or I should be doing that. And, or, go ahead and make all the excuses you want to. But be like David and say, Lord, I acknowledge my sin. I acknowledge that you're revealing something in me. Lord, help me. Yes. Help me to overcome. And by the Holy Spirit's power, God will do just that. Amen. It'll come in increments, but you'll find slowly but surely, Amen. God Amen. It will do this powerful work in you. And before you know it, your relationship with that individual will start to change. Amen. They'll start seeing you being more giving, more extending of yourself towards them. And they'll wonder, well, what in the world's going on? But I'm telling you, beloved, the Holy Spirit is in you to produce in you what you can't do. Amen. You cannot do it. But God wants to transform you. He wants you to be renewed. He wants you to be changed into the image of his son. And he's promised that he's going to do that. Yes. But you got to give him free will, free reign to do that in your heart by acknowledging your sin. Acknowledge it. And then confess it. And he says, I will be faithful and just to forgive you. And I'll clean you up. And Father, we thank you for First this. 1 John 1.9. 1, Sorry. We thank you for this word. Thank you for what you've given us today, Lord. Thank we thank you for the clarity. You know, Father Heavy, your, your, your word, you just don't lie. You showed up, Father Heavy, thank again, you. the answers to the questions, Lord. Thank you. You, know, you know, um, I made us aware that, Father Heaven, that we can mm -hmm. come and ask you questions and that yes. you will answer us, Lord. You also uh, allowed us to, Father, and see the signs that, Father, that follow you, the yes. Father Heaven, that, uh, uh, that you actually did, that, that we have witnessed it. You do these things, Father Heaven. We know now the Father of Heaven that we are to forgive, Lord. Not yes, only just for one time or two times, Lord, but the number's so great that we can't recount. Yeah. The Father of Heaven, let us remember the Father of Heaven that we don't belong by ourselves. And that we're to be like you. Mm -hmm. Forgiving God, we should be forgiving people. And Father, anything in us is not pleasing to you, Lord. We ask the Father of Heaven right now to move it from us. Yes, Lord. We give our we, we willingly the Father of Heaven to Father render Lord. all to you, Lord. All means the Father of Heaven. Search our hearts, our minds, mm -hmm. our motives, the Father of Heaven, anything in us, the Father of Heaven. It's not pleasing to you. We we'll actually move it. Mm -hmm. Make us uh, vessels that you could use, the Father of Heaven. So when people see us, see us in you, and you and us, we ask all of these things, the Father of Heaven. In Jesus' holy name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Y'all have a wonderful week in the Lord.